So let's talk about Galeazzi fractures. Um, this is a great example of, of what a fracture really is. A fracture is a soft tissue injury that involves bone. That's probably the best way to look at any fracture because it's not the healed bone that is the prolonged problem for the patient. It's the soft tissue injury that is associated with it. And as we've talked about the distal radio ulnar joint, for instance, is that continuing distal radio ulnar joint pain that's out eight months after these, the, after these heal. It's that soft tissue that heals last. So this is just an example of, of, of a combination of a fracture of the forearm uh, associated with a distal radio ulnar joint injury. It occurs in uh, four to seven percent of forearm fractures. It can be associated uh, with both bone fractures. You can have a dislocation of the distal radio ulnar joint and have a both bone fracture. And as a matter of fact, a guy named Mick um, in a European study looked at these and he found that that, that actually occurred in, um, in about 7% of his Galeazzi fractures. It, and and it it's really is no ordinary fracture. And the reason that it isn't is it was, uh, it was first described by Cooper, Ashley Cooper. So for those of you that are historians and, and like to read medicine, what, what, what did Ashley Cooper, it doesn't have his name associated with this fracture at all. Nobody thinks of Ashley Cooper and Galeazzi fractures. Yeah. What, did, what else did, Gale, did, did, did Cooper describe before his time and before the end? He, he actually described Dupuytren's disease. He was the first one to actually explain it. Maybe there was a, a Swiss surgeon named Basel who described it, but he really didn't get it right. But Ashley Cooper actually described it well before Dupuytren's. And, but it doesn't bear his name, nor does this. Galeazzi, in 1934, wrote about this. Um, it was called the fracture of necessity, uh, meaning that it had to be fixed in order to reduce the distal radius fracture. And the Piedmont Society, which is a, a group of uh, Duke graduates who meet on an annual or semi or biannual basis, uh, met together, and uh, a guy named Jack Houston one of the godfathers of sports medicine in the, in the United States, wrote an article that says, you know, it's absolutely necessary and essential that you reduce this fracture with rigid internal fixation at a time in the mid-50s where, where rigid internal fixation in the United States wasn't very popular. So Mickick, as I referred to, uh, had 125 um, cases. 14 of them were children. And he, and he noticed that if you treat children closed, um, and got a reduction. They actually did well in place. They did fine. But of these 125 patients, he had 111 adults, and those that were treated open, they did well, but those that were treated closed did very, very poorly and had continued pain. And the reason for that is because they would heal with angulation, but they would also heal with a continued distal radial ulnar joint subluxation. So the radiographic findings that are consistent with a Galeazzi fracture is an ulnar styloid fracture at the fovea. Okay. That's a, a hallmark sign. Five millimeters of ulnar shortening in the setting of a single isolated distal radius fracture. And then a dorsal ulna on a lateral, on a true lateral projection. And it doesn't have to be that dramatic, but it can be. The surgical approaches to this is not the extended FCR approach. The surgical approach to this has got to be a true Henry approach. And the reason for that is the following, is that in a true Henry approach, as you go through it, you'll find that your dissection keeps the radial artery always medial, always towards the ulna. Whereas in an FCR approach, you have to flip over a radial artery, shown right here. And so it sweeps it and keeps it out of the way. The other thing that you have to watch out for is the superficial branch of the um, radial nerve that sits on the underbelly of the brachial radialis in this exposure. And 
You can use the Henry exposure all the way from the radial styloid all the way up to the tuberosity and beyond the tuberosity to the arcade of Froch, and you can fix the entire radius from its neck down to its styloid through this exposure. So it's a very facile exposure of the radius in the forearm. So the management, the treatment of this is fix it. That simple. Management of the unstable distal radial ulnar joint is if it's stable post-reduction, the distal radial ulnar joint that is, if it's stable post-reduction, you fix the radius, you've plated it, we've given that, you put it into position and it feels stable, then I will immobilize these patients for three weeks in supination. And the p amount of supination is 60 degrees. Not a complete 90, but 60 degrees. And uh, David Roosh demonstrated that that puts the, uh, the, the ligaments that uh, Tom Fisher and uh, Jerry Wong described in great detail uh, this morning. It puts them at equilateral stretch. So it makes the, the ligaments collinear and, and puts them on equal stretch and rest the, the joint in that position. So three, be, three weeks of supination, uh, three weeks in neutral. Now, if it's unstable after you fix the radius, there, there's two reasons that it, it is unstable. It just won't reduce, and you can't reduce it. Or you can reduce it, but it won't stay there. Okay? So if you can't reduce it, the reason you can't reduce it is there's something in the way. And this is an example of that. This is a child who has Galeazzi fracture. But if you look over here, this guy is always off right here. And you know, although it's hidden in this x-ray, and this is before we routinely got CT scans, here's the ulnar head out here. Here's this fracture that isn't really well reduced. And in these settings, the, the reason that that happens is the following, is you get something interposed. And you can have, in this case, you have the extensor carpi ulnaris transposed between the joint, sitting in between the joint and crossing into that. This passing into, as a description of things that get caught in here, you can have the entire triangular fibrocartilage complex interposed. You can have a profundus tendon interposed. And you can have the ulnar neurovascular bundle, which is one of the, the more devastating things to have happen, especially in a referral practice where you'll have this referred at six, eight weeks, and you'll find that as you're dissecting along here, you find that the ulnar neurovascular bundle comes through the interosseous membrane, comes back here, and then back down as you, dis as you dissect that out. So you look for, immediately look for the things that get trapped in there or in, in, in space. So if you can't reduce it and it won't stay there, then you have to do something about that. And we'll just look at this simply. Well, what if you just pin it in place of all the things that you have here that you can put in place? This is the, the sort of the good old days, is to hold it in place. But I think it's very much like that study that we saw yesterday on pseudonismotic screws and, and placement, trying to find that exactly where it's going to fit. Maybe it's not important, but I think it's very difficult to get a perfect fit when you're using screw fixation like that. I think that in the in, those, in the setting of an, a totally unstable distal radial ulnar joint in a Galeazzi fracture, this right here sets in place, and that becomes a problem. You can take this whole complex, don't strip it off of the soft tissues, and put it in place, and it'll go there. And the way to do that, the easiest way to remember and how to get to here, is if you flex the forearm and put it into supination, this line right here, and right here, comes right up and leads you to the ulnar styloid. It's a straight line. Whereas if you put your finger on that and then you go into a pronated hand, that tip goes volarly. It's very difficult to reduce, but it reduces itself in this position. So do your radius, bring it up into pronation. Flex the elbow, or in supination, flex the elbow. And then you can capture that, either open or closed. And this is the one place where arthroscopists might consider it uh, helpful to use an arthroscope in that setting. I don't, I just open them and put them in place and then finish the lock. And in those cases, postoperative mobilization is elbow flexed at 90 degrees, supination is 60 degrees, wrist in slight extension. And I hold that for a duration of three to six weeks. I do that. So in Galeazzi fractures, assume the worst Treat the radius always with internal fixation in an adult. 
or a late child or a teen. Know that we, we would like subluxation or dislocation of the distal, we'd like subluxation of the distal radial ulnar joint to be addressed by tightening the entire structure in the unit by fixing the radius. And if it doesn't, then we need to treat it with uh, open, or open fixation and some of the techniques that were described by uh, Jerry. But for the most part, you can repair these primarily. Thank you. I uh, wanted to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Bonnegastner up to the podium next, uh, and she'll give you a talk on montage of fracture dislocations. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move along once again to a topic that Dr. Ring knows a lot more than I do about, um, but we'll uh, talk again about montage um, injuries. And this is kind of an interesting topic because I think a lot of the problem with Montagia injuries, particularly the more complex ones, is really a lack of recognition of the injury pattern. And so in order to restore stability to the elbow, we really have to understand what is causing the instability in the first place. And so these two injuries, when you first just glance at them, you think, oh, those are both kind of bad fracture dislocations of the elbow. But these are completely different injuries, the one on the left being a posterior Montagia injury and the one on the right being a transalecranon fracture dislocation. And so they need different things addressed in order to restore stability. And so the basic definition of a Montagia fracture is a fracture of the forearm with dislocation of the proximal radial ulnar joint. And that's the key. It's not dislocation of the radio capitellar joint. That's a secondary feature, but it's actually dislocation of the proximal radial ulnar joint. And that's something that is universal for all of the different types of Montagia fractures that we see. I think everybody's very familiar with this basic classification of, of Montagia injuries with the type 1 being anterior, type 2 posterior, and then the type 3 with lateral and the type 4 with an, with an uh, added fracture of the radial shaft. The type 2s have been subclassified um, into type 2A to D. Um, and again, these are just varying in complexity and location of the ulna fracture. Um, and so again, you have to recognize the different patterns of involvement. But the interesting thing about the type 2 fractures is that they also have a disruption of the greater sigmoid notch of the olecranon. And so that's something that's a little bit different from some of the other Montagia patterns and something that I think causes confusion between these injuries and a trans type of fracture. So in adults and children, Montagia fractures behave very differently. I think in children with an anterior Montagia, it's your typical fall off the monkey bars, uh, can be treated in a closed fashion. But in adults, these are typically the result of higher energy trauma. So if you see an anterior Montagia fracture in an adult, something that you have to be aware of is really looking for, uh, for additional vascular injuries or neurologic injuries or compartmental syndrome. So those patients are certainly at increased risk for that versus the type 2s, which often will actually look like a worse bony injury, um, but they're usually the result of a lower energy trauma, like an older person falling from standing or tripping or falling from a low height. But they often have associated injuries such as ligament injuries, coronoid fractures, and radial head fractures that need to be addressed. And so the most important part of treating Montagia injuries is getting stable fixation, because the stable fixation of the ulnar component of the injury is what restores elbow stability. And so if you don't have good ulnar fixation, then you haven't addressed both the fracture and the elbow instability problem, which is the underlying issue for these. Anatomic reduction in this fracture is very necessary. So this can't be just close or close enough. These have to be anatomic in order to restore elbow stability. And if the radial head won't reduce, then you have to go back and recheck your ulnar anatomy and your ulnar alignment and make sure that you've gotten that perfect. So here's a case um, of ours. This is an anterior Montagia, a little bit of a variant. Um, this patient came in from high-speed motor vehicle collision, obviously with multiple other injuries. It doesn't quite fit the pattern. However, if you look at it, this patient has a disruption of the proximal radial ulnar joint. So even though there is an ulnar shaft in this anterior um, disruption of the, of the radial head, there's also a, a lecranon fracture component here. But what's going to restore stability here is restoring that ulnar length. Um, so this is an olecranon fracture separate from an anterior Montagia type of injury. And so this is addressed by treating both the olecranon component, but that's not what's going to restore the stability alone. It's getting that ulnar shaft out to length and anatomically aligned that will restore uh, stability to this elbow. This is different. So this patient also has an ulnar shaft fracture and an elbow with a uh, radial head that's gone anteriorly, but you can see the proximal radial ulnar joint is not disrupted in this patient. And so this is a different injury pattern. This is a trans fracture dislocation. And so what this injury is, is an anterior fracture dislocation of the <coughs> elbow, where the primary problem is a disruption of the ulnohumeral articulation, but the proximal radial ulnar joint stays intact, so that entire complex moves anteriorly. 
And so this is primarily addressed, again, by fixing both components. So it looks like a very similar construct, but the key component to restoring stability in this elbow is getting anatomic alignment of the olecranon component of the injury, and that's what has restored stability in this fracture. What about this one? Again, this is a typical anterior montagia pattern. It had kind of has a blasted proximal ulna, but again, it follows the same principle. So clearly the proximal radial ulnar joint is disrupted. And so when we were fixing this, we had great fracture reads so that we could line up the olecranon component of the injury. And you can see on the left, the olecranon is lined up anatomically, but we still have subluxation anteriorly of the radial head. And that was because the shaft was comminuted and we had it a little bit too short in that at that time, so we added a little bit of length to the ulna to align it anatomically, and you can see on the image on the right now the radial head has reduced. And so that was the component of the injury that restored elbow stability, and here's this patient's follow-up at six months with good motion and a stable reduced elbow. The type 2 Montagia injury is one, again, that was described uh, by Dr. Ring, and this is a fracture that involves multiple components of the proximal ulna, um, and it's a, not a very common problem, um, but we actually looked up a series of them here. Um, we had a number of at least 16 of them. We've had quite a few more since then. And when we looked more carefully at these injuries, we found that there was a lot of specific components to these injuries that could be addressed. So we could turn kind of a more complex injury into something that was more manageable by understanding all of the fracture components and the ligament injury components as well. And so here's a typical example of a type 2D posterior montagia fracture. And so we have the radial head fracture component of the injury. There's typically this anterior ulnar cortical fragment that seems to be universally present in these fractures. The coronoid fracture component. There's an olecranon component with the tricep still attached to it. There's often a separate fragment containing the medial ligament, and it's typically a bone avulsion. So there's a piece of a fragment of bone that can be fixed. And then often a lateral ulnar collateral ligament uh, disruption directly off of the humerus. That's one area that you particularly have to look for. Often the fascia will still be intact over that area, but after everything's fixed, you really have to go up and look there. And I often divide the fascia, and you'll find that the lateral collateral ligaments are actually disrupted, and that needs to be fixed as well. And so we know, again, some of the key points, regardless of the pattern, large coronoid fractures must be anatomically reduced. Um, you, can re you can address multiple different components of this injury through different muscular intervals through the same incision. So the posterior midline incision is kind of the workhorse for this, and then you can address the components as needed through various intervals. You really, again, have to look for the ligament injuries in these, and they need to be addressed and fixed as well. And so here's an example of a patient. This is our fixation technique for these types of fractures. Typically, like to do these in a lateral position. A prone position works as well with the arm over an arm board. And the first thing that we address is the radial head. And so in order to see that, we sort of flip or turn the, the olecranon component out of the way. And as soon as the olecranon component is moved out of the way, you have a direct view down onto the radial head and down onto the coronoid fragments. We like to start with the radial head because as soon as you start fixing the ulnar components of this injury, you start losing access to the radial head. So the first thing to do, for example, in this one that needed a radial head arthroplasty, is to actually size the radial head arthroplasty. But the problem is determining the height of your arthroplasty with an ulna that's broken. And so what we typically do is just provisionally clamp the ulna out to length so that we can size um, the radial head component. And you can see we just have the olecranon component clamped as well. And this is the radial head trial. Then you have to undo that ulnar reduction and place the definitive implant because then you lose access to that. The next thing that we do is then address the coronoid. So the radial head implant's been put in. We start to address the coronoid fragments. And you can see multiple mini fragment screws here. Oftentimes little mini fragment plates will be helpful as well to hold that component of the injury. Or you even can use some <coughs> sutures that are carefully placed so that you don't um, hit them with your drill bits later. And so once the coronoid component's been fixed, you can then bring some of the, that anterior ulnar cortical shaft component can be incorporated, and that will often help you determine the length of the ulnar shaft. That can be just held simply with some smaller mini fragment plates. After that's done, then you kind of close the door. So you bring the olecranon component down, reduce it, and then you need a stout plate for that. So something of a 3.5 LCDC thickness um, is helpful. A lot of the pre-contoured plates are great for this. Um, but it needs to be something thick. This is not a recon plate or a third tubular or something small. That won't work for these. You need a stout plate to kind of gather the whole thing together. And then you can also see there's a ligament repair as well. So this patient had a vulse, the lateral collateral ligament, that's fixed with a suture anchor. Um, and the MCL was off as well from the sublime tubercle, which was also repaired. And so here's a final result on a patient like that. But they're not always 
they don't always fit the pattern. So here's another example of a patient with a similar fracture pattern. It's a posterior montagia, but there's also a dislocation of the ulnohumeral joint. This is less common, but this is just in, indicates a higher degree of violence around the elbow, and a lot of soft tissue stripping occurred on this patient. So again, multiple components to this injury, which were addressed. And this is the patient in the operating room. It's pretty stable out to full extension, stable um, in all positions. But he woke up kind of with a bang and pushed himself up out of bed, probably disrupted his lateral ligament uh, repair in the recovery room. So this was his final films. And this was him on post-op day four when we were rounding. He said, you know, I felt this clunk in my elbow. and. Uh, he also felt really crappy because he had this going on in his abdomen. And he said, you know, I do not want to go back to the operating room. don't want a general anesthetic. And you got to do something about this without doing that. So we kind of put our heads together and thought about it. This is him. We just brought him to the fluoro suite. We could reduce him easily. This is held, him held in 90 degrees of flexion. And I thought, well, I guess we'll have to just cast him for a little while and see if that holds him. But of course, at two weeks, he starts to sublux. So then we went back to the biomechanics thinking of this. And so we know that muscle forces and pronation will stabilize the lateral ligament deficient elbow. And so that's an important um, a piece of biomechanical data to help when you have a problem like this, because basically he was having posterolateral rotatory instability. That's what we were seeing there. And of course, again, Dr. Ring, uh, who's an expert on this, published this great paper on uh, residual subluxation of the elbow after dislocation or fracture dislocation. And so using this information combined with that biomechanics data, we thought we should try this protocol, which is having the patient keep their arm at their side, institute active motion, which will stabilize the elbow, and the patient should hopefully resolve their subluxation. And so this is before we started that. This is him out of his cast. At three weeks, we got him doing this with physical therapy. Here he is at four weeks, and at 10 weeks, and at six months. So he's stable, reduced, and uh, he avoided another surgery. Now, this isn't for somebody who's grossly unstable and dislocating, but I think for somebody with a little bit of residual subluxation, um, it's a good thing to keep in mind. And for me, I institute that protocol with all my elbow ligament repairs and all posterior montages. If I fix their ligaments, I follow that protocol of arm at the side, form and pronation, active motion, and then they can supinate when they're in full flexion. This is what you don't want to have happen with a posterior montage. This is a lady that was sent in, um, clearly had that injury. Unfortunately, the radial head was resected. This is another example of a time when you don't want to remove the radial head, or if you do, you need to replace it. The coronoid piece was just kind of ignored, um, and so we had to revise that. But again, following the similar principles of restoring the radial head, of restoring a coronoid, um, and fixing all components of the injury, and she ended up with a stable elbow. So in summary, there's multiple variants of proximal ulna fractures, and it's important to recognize the injuries and make sure that you understand which component of the injury is causing the instability, make sure that gets addressed. And restoring the elbow stability is the key. So we can deal with a stiff, reduced elbow, but dealing with a stiff, unreduced elbow is a much more difficult problem. Thank you. Thank you.